All right, we're going to try to get through this with some tea. I've been uh, sick for a while. So if I shake your hand, you've caught it. No. So we, we have been doing this series on cultivating character with the idea that it, it would be really nice to know the difference between uh, kind of a, a, a constrained heart and a reformed heart. Like, we can force ourselves to do good stuff, but there's something different about being transformed and God just completely changing us. And so we've been looking at what some of that might be and how we might cooperate with God. And, of course, today is Mother's Day, and so I thought, well, I wonder if I should, like, go off on that or and do something different for mom, Mother's Day. So I texted my mom and said, Mom, can I preach about whatever I want to this week? She did respond. She called and said, absolutely. So there you go. I get to do whatever I want in honor of Mother's Day. But maybe this actually does have to do a little bit with Mother's Day. Uh, we, we're going to be talking about the character trait of humility. And I suppose that does matter a lot. I mean, certainly, I think one of the things that you figure out as a parent, and, and I've seen this demonstrated certainly in uh, Lisa as she is mom to her children, and watching that kind of that humility that it takes to just serve and give and care. But I want to look at that this morning, and um, the thing is, is I think in our culture we hate the idea of humility. I mean, maybe hate's too strong of a word. Uh, we, we, we like it in other people. We don't want other people to be arrogant, but for ourselves, it's a little different. I, I love the way C.S. Lewis puts it when he, uh, in his case for Christianity, that, I'm going to be a little embarrassed. I've been quoting from C.S. Lewis a lot lately. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm on a reading kick with him, and so you're going to have to deal with it with me as well. But he writes, uh, there is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine they are guilty themselves. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, all that are merely flea bites in comparison. It was through the pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. You see, and I, and I think I can make a larger case that our culture just generally doesn't like. It doesn't promote it. The idea of humility is not promoted, but pride is. You need, to, you need to be out there for yourselves. You need to promote yourselves. You need to be famous. Leave your mark. Be remembered. That's not only true in our culture now. It has been the case for most of human history, I, so looking back at some of the ancient Greek philosophers and why I chose Greek is you realize at the time of the passage that we're going to be looking at, uh, the Jews were in, under oppression by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, you might see this in the Bible a lot, they would call the Roman citizens Greeks. And the reason they did that is because, you know, Alexander the Great in about 333 B.C., you know, he conquers a huge swath of land, that, and he's a Greek, a Macedonian, that ends up becoming the Roman Empire. And they really longed, they liked the Greeks and the Greek philosophy, but one of the philosophers, the, the teacher of Alexander the Great was Aristotle. And Aristotle even points out in his book on ethics that the opposite of humility is a virtue. He calls it Magnanimity. Look what he says, and um, yeah, let's skip ahead to it. I'll get to this in a second. The magnanimous person then seems to be the one who thinks himself worthy of great things and is really worthy of them. See, what he's trying to say is that, that, that really what you want to be is you want to be able to talk a big game and follow it up. That's virtue. You want to be able to say you're all that and be all that. Now, there's certainly a problem if you're a little rash, you're a little bold, you want to try to claim that you're something more than, uh, than you are, but you want to really be able to talk big and act big. 
That would be the virtue. Matter of fact, nowhere in the uh, in Nicomachean ethics or any of the ethics of the Greek philosophers or uh, the Roman times are you going to see where humility is considered a virtue. Yet, let's look at this passage, a, a, a famous passage. And some scholars even believe part of the oldest part of the New Testament is here in Philippians 2. Let's go here. All right, therefore... If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Now, just to be clear, as Paul is writing this to the church in Philippi, they are struggling a little bit with some division. They're not getting along real well. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I, I, I want to be really practical. You guys need to get along. You need to be one mind, one spirit, be in this together. But then all of a sudden he jumps from being really what seems really practical to this deep theological thing about the very nature of Christ. Look what he says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, for those of you who happen to be following along, if you're looking in your Bibles uh, here, you may notice this next section is written differently than the rest. Like it literally lays out on the page differently. Now, scholars have debated whether Paul is writing a hymn or whether he's quoting one. And most that I've read seem to suggest that they believe he's quoted. That's why it's one of the oldest. This seems to be a hymn, a saying, a, 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 something the early church would repeat over and over to themselves to remind themselves of this deep truth. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The idea of humility. See, for the uh, Greeks, the idea of humility would have been, well, dumb. See, humility is a virtue only for the servant. Humility is the virtue only for doormats. The idea of a God of armies, the one who could conquer, the one who was more powerful, that makes sense. That we too would be conquering and after honor and glory, that we could go into battle and, and use our power and force others to our will. That is the virtue of most of the world and certainly of Rome and the ancient Greeks. But here, as Paul is writing and quoting this very thing about Jesus himself, Remember the passage where it said, he took on the very nature of a servant. And yet we are opposed to it. I suggest, and this is the first blank in your outline, pride is a disease. That you and I have a disease. And that that disease is pride. Here's where I think it comes from. You see, I think you and I were built to be noticed. We long to be seen. We long to be remembered. We long to be counted. We long for people like they would notice us. They would hear us. They would pay attention to us. We long for that. We like that idea that, that when we say something that would matter, that people would care enough to pay attention. And, and there's something deep about that. I, 
I remember when I was a youth pastor down in Southern California, and, and I got a cr call from one of my youth, a girl, uh, one evening, kind of late on a Friday evening, just in tears. And she is just crying and crying. And I'm like, what's going on? And she says, so I was out with my friends. We were all out. We you know, had our separate cars, and we were going. We went to this one person's house, and we were there, and we were going to go to these other places and do these things. But at one point, uh, you know, while they were, we were all still there, I went into the bathroom, and they used that as an opportunity to ditch me. Every one of them took off laughing and left me behind. And my heart broke for her. And I suspect in hearing this and seeing some of your faces that you recognize that pain. None of us want that. That idea of, of being in a group and everyone, the only way they target us is to abandon us is heartbreaking. We long to be seen. We long to be heard. We long to be known. And I don't believe that that is the problem. The problem is that we settle for the world's version of being seen. Notice what it says here in 1 John. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The thing that we, I, I want us to see here is that Scripture is making this uh, distinction between the temporariness of the world and the foreverness of the things of God. You and I were built for the foreverness of being seen and heard and remembered and known. But we settle because we have run from God, because we are separated from God. We settle and desperately long for the world to tell us we matter. We want to leave our mark. We want to be famous. We want to write the next great American novel. We want our name to be remembered. We want to have a Wikipedia page for us. Like we long for that. We, we shoot for that. We, we, we desire to just be famous. If people could just know us. See, we are fading. And we know we are fading. Because of our separation from God, we are in a world that is temporary, and our lives here are temporary. And the things that we accomplish or do or can be are going to be, at best, if only viewed in this world, temporary. Temporary. My great-grandmother, Helen, she, uh, my great-grandmother had my grandmother when she was 20. My grandmother had my mother when she was 20. And so when my mother had me when she was 20, she called her grandmother up, my great-grandmother, who was getting ready to turn 60 and letting her know that she's going to have a great-grandchild because I was the first in the generation because that's the best since we're talking about humility. And she, my great-grandmother, according to my mom, hung up on her saying, I am too young to be a great-grandma. <laughs> well, the thing is, is I knew my great-grandmother. I had the privilege of growing up and knowing her. Uh, she ended up dying uh, when I was in college. Uh, but so I had 20 some on years with her, which was fantastic. But and I knew her and we had conversations and I had memories of being at her home and in her house and that kind of stuff. And and uh, uh, the thing is, is I knew her. I know nothing about her parents. I, I couldn't name them. I could barely name her husband who had died before I was born, my great grandfather, or I don't know a thing about him. But I definitely don't know anything about uh, her parents or anything. I, she might have told me stories. I don't remember it. So if, if, if really the measure of a person is who remembers you, who knows you, who whatever, like as far as my generation, much less my kids, they, they don't know. Their memory has gone. And if all it is in this world, they have faded. And, and their mark, at least as far as any of us know, is gone. And yet we know, I think we fight against that. We fight so desperately. We want to be seen and known and remembered. But we settle for this worldly temporary thing. Remember the passage when we just read it? How it says, have nothing to do with selfish ambition or vain conceit. That vain conceit line is really interesting. See, it is to have conceit in something that's vain, meaning pointless, useless. 
that, that, that we are willing to receive honor and glory for doing nothing. Like that would be far superior to us to, to receive some kind of notoriety even if we didn't deserve it. Just to be known because far more devastating to us is to just not be known. Matter of fact, I suggest we are so broken, we are so diseased with pride, we don't even know what health would look like because we have been running from it for so long because our culture teaches us to run from it. So the next blank in your outline, I want to talk a little bit about what health looks like. Now, I'm taking this kind of secondarily through, um, <clears throat> so Jonathan Edwards, a uh, preacher back right before the, uh, the Revolutionary War, and he would talk a lot about this idea of pride and came up with a number of places. And then Tim Keller, who I've mentioned a number of times, who I have relied heavily on for this series, he kind of summarized about four things that as, as, as really good kind of tests for how we are doing in humility. And now, Edwards, Edwards was talking about pride, so we're going to put this in the negative. If this is pride, then humility would be the opposite of that. And I want to take a little bit of what that looks like. The first thing I think health would look like, as we summarize this, would be being not successful. To not be successful. Now, I don't literally mean that we shouldn't be successful. We can enjoy something. We could have ambition. Notice that the passage had self, have nothing to do with selfish ambition. There's something different between ambition and selfish ambition. You may want to excel in something. You may really enjoy something and want to do well at it in your job, in your hobbies, in your life, and something, and do that. And you may enjoy it for its own sake. A runner can really enjoy running and just enjoy it for its own sake and in the race try to excel. But the runner that just loves running for the sake of running can be just as happy or nearly as happy if his friend wins the race than if he does. But that's seldom how we operate. That's seldom how we operate. We want to get the prize. We run in such a way that we are in the front. We long to do it in many ways, not for its own sake, but in comparison to others. See, it's not enough that we are kind and good-looking and smart and wealthy. The issue is, are we wealthier and smarter and more good-looking than others? Like, that, that are we the smartest in the room? Are we the prettiest in the room? Do we, are, are we going to be the one? Again, C.S. Lewis in that same uh, series of lectures for the case of Christianity, which, by the way, if you've ever read Mere Christianity, he used those to create the beginning of that. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than the others. If someone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. We don't want to win the silver medal. We want to win the gold. We don't want to be known as somebody who enjoyed it and competed. We want to know to be known as the winner. If all we long for and all we're after is to just be, man, I need to get this over and above the other. Selfish ambition. And should be a red flag for us. So humility would be not successful in that sense. It would also be not scornful. I had to come up with words, so all of these are with an S. I don't know how to say this apart from the fact that I believe just about 90% of online presence is an example of being scornful. I don't know if it's really 90%. But when I see what passes for comments and debate, I, like I've listened to people who you know, they post things, they are regular online contributors, and they will tell you, never pay attention to the comments. And the reason is because the comments are often about being scornful. It's about, you know, if I could just share that meme that lets people know that they're idiots, 
and then they'll finally understand how right I am. If I can just get that gotcha moment, you know, in that debate that I can get that slick burn in so that they just know that they've been had, that kind of scorn and contempt is the opposite, opposite of humility. If I can just put sarcasm in just the well-placed way, that it, again, I, I'm not saying, there, there can be fun in just light-hearted bantering back and forth with people you know, people who love and won't take it seriously. But there's something about it. Edwards, when he was writing, was talking specifically about our tendency to call people on the other side evil. That we dehumanize them immediately if they are on the other side politically or theologically or whatever. And our attempt to, to do that, to say, how can people, you know, the youth these days, or what does the world come to? How the, and automatically describe those who disagree with us as somehow evil. Or I would even argue just when we go with just, okay, well, they're just stupid. Uh, that that's enough. That, that kind of scornful is, is to place ourselves above them. And in doing so, we move away from humility. Not successful, not scornful, and not smart. Again, there's nothing wrong with being smart. It can be really good. People that are awed by learning new things and becoming more. But, I, you know, I remember making the distinction long ago when we, were, uh, when we had the opportunity to coach soccer for kids. Lisa and I did, and, and uh, the fact that we were doing it lets you know how desperate this club was. Uh, it, you know, Lisa actually had some skill, but wasn't available all the time, so it was left with me, and I know nothing. Like, I'm watching YouTube videos on how to do it, just trying to offer something to these kids. But one of the distinctions I tried to make for these kids is they said, there's a difference between trying to be good and trying to be better. For those of you who want to be good, that you're, you're going to pick the battles you know you can win. You'll only be satisfied if you're on top. You want to look better than everybody else. But those who just want to get better at the sport, regardless of where they are, use every opportunity to learn more, to become more, those are the real soccer players. And so the distinction is, is in many ways for those of who want to be smart, who, who say, like, I like to learn, I love to know more stuff, that's great, but there's something different for those who just need to be the smartest in the room. I, I think the real difference is, are we teachable? Like, we all know people like that, 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 that know that they're the smartest in the room, that make sure their point comes across, and their whole point in having the discussion is to let you know how wrong you are. Kids, be quiet. No comments right now. No, the, the thing is, is in doing that, to, to, to be that, if you're not willing to learn and grow and, and be part of that, not teachable, you know, I was, my heart was warm the other day. I was talking to my sister who's in Germany, and she was talking about her sons and that they have adopted, I don't know if I told you guys this, they've adopted the I Was Wrong song. We, had a, we have a uh, tradition in our family that if, if you are willing to make a claim, you say something and somebody contradicts you, and you double down and say, no, I'm absolutely right, that all of a sudden the stakes have become the I Was Wrong song. You go and find out the information, and whoever's wrong in that has to sing you were right and I was wrong. I'm going to sing the I was wrong song. And that's it. That's what you got to do. And I remember one time, I think it was Luke, was like, no, I'm not going to sing it. I'm not going to sing it. And, and so I said, okay, you have that right. Well, nobody's going to force you to. But realize from here on out, you never get to have anybody else sing it if they're wrong. He's like, okay. And he sang it. But one of the things that we've done in doing that is just to say, okay, you know, it's okay to be wrong. Just admit that you're wrong and go on. That's okay. The lack of willingness to do that, to have to be the authority in the room, to have to be the one that's right, is the opposite of humility. Someone who is humble doesn't have to be the smartest in the room. And then not being self-conscious. This one I'm going to have to take a little bit of time with. You see, I think what happens is for a lot of us when we think of humility, that the opposite of humility, we think of somebody with pride, we think of somebody who is arrogant, who's always talking themselves up, who wants to be their center of attention, and is always on display, and has to, you know, is always looking in the mirror to make sure they look good, and doing all this stuff, being that, like that person. But interestingly enough, we can be just as prideful if we find ourselves not measuring up. 
if we're completely self-conscious, so uh, desperate about how we look to others, how we're coming across, Let me go this way. Because the point I want to make is real humility is not thinking less of yourself. Because you're still thinking about yourself. Real humility is just thinking about yourself less. That you're not the focus. So another C.S. Lewis quote this morning. This one from the screw tape letters. How many of you are familiar with screw tape letters? A, a few of you, good. Okay, so let me explain, because I feel like any time I preach, I have to explain. So C.S. Lewis is writing this fictional book, and he's writing it in the idea that it's all a bunch of letters from a senior demon to a lower demon. And see, the idea is that he's talking, that this lower demon is, has, is obviously writing letters, talking about this, this person he's trying to corrupt, and they keep calling him the patient, that he's trying to corrupt him, and he's getting advice from this senior demon who keeps telling himself what to do. So anytime you read this, you've got to kind of turn yourself upside down a little bit because you're reading advice from one demon to another demon on how to corrupt somebody. So the enemy is God. The patient is the person you're trying to corrupt. You know, those kind of things, okay? So here is what's going on. The, this, the uh, demon is screw tape. The senior demon is screw tape, and he's writing to his underling, Wormwood. My dear Wormwood, the most alarming thing in your last account of the patient is that he is making none of those confident resolutions which marked his original conversion. No more lavish promises of perpetual virtue, I gather. Not even the expectation of an endowment of grace for life, but only a hope for the daily and hourly pittance to meet the daily and hourly temptation. This is very bad. I see only one thing to do at the moment. Your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to that fact? All virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them. But this is especially true of humility. Catch him at that moment when he's really poor in spirit and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection, reflection by Jove, I am humble. And almost immediately, pride. Pride at his own humility will appear. If he awakes to the danger and tries to smother this new form of pride, make him proud of that moment. And so on. Through as many stages as you please, but, but don't try that too long. For fear you awake his sense of humor and proportion, in which case he'll merely laugh at you and go to bed. You see what's going on here is that as we talk about humility, it's not a thing that you can just chase after for itself. Because by chasing after it, we, we become even... Doesn't it mean that then that preaching on humility is useless? I mean, really, this whole time that we've been talking about it, if you've been reflecting on your humility, chances are we become less humble just thinking about it. So maybe I shouldn't even preach on it at all. It's, just, it's kind of dumb. But it's because we can't get it by chasing it directly. That it can't be about us. And so the first point that I was making about not being self-conscious, you can't like do something to yourself and think about such a way about yourself to make yourself humble. That's not how it works. That ultimately I see only one possible cure. You got to focus on something that's even more important than even humility. And what would that be? Well, the Sunday school answer. Jesus. You got to give up on the race. If you find yourself struggling, you know, you go through this list, and it's, 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 it's a crazy list, right? Well, am I being uh, six, worried about being successful or scornful or smart, self-conscious, you know, all these things. But you know what's going to happen, right? Just by even focusing on this, someday we're going to see somebody who's a little, like, has to be the smartest in the room, and we're going to go, I know what's going on. You're being proud. And all of a sudden, we lose our own humility. The key is not to focus on our humility, not to focus even on our own virtue, but to simply focus on Jesus. And how do we do that? Well, folks, I believe wholeheartedly this is the place where worship comes in. 
This is the place where we try to spend our time focusing on the worthiness of Christ. I mean, I've been really bowled over the past week about how beautiful Mount Hood has looked. And how crazy would it be for me to to take a picture of some little hill I build with uh, Mount Hood in the background going, look how great I am. I mean, it's just silly. But instead, well, the whole goal is that we would focus on Jesus. Do you realize what happened in this passage in Philippians? It, it, man, this passage is talked about so much. If you talk about the nature of Christ, you're going to study it in seminary. It's all this. But it's almost in three parts that we see that Jesus ultimately, you know, says, first, he was in heaven and he didn't consider equality with God, so he came to earth. And then not only was he on earth, but he died. He became obedient to death on a cross. And then, as he was dead on the cross, he, became, he, he was raised into glory. That you see. You get up by going down. The whole twist of the gospel is that our whole point is just, it's not about us. We're not going to get there by raising ourselves up. We've got to think of ourselves less, and that's where worship comes in. The whole idea of us gathering together and singing or in our quiet time or focusing on God is to do that, that it's all about Jesus. So here's what I would like to do this this morning. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. And uh, as they go ahead and come up, Uh, Yeah, seriously, yeah, come on. As they do that, they're going to lead us in yet another worship song. Now, this is something we've been doing up to this point, right? We, We worship together, but I'm hoping we can do this with a whole new sense that this isn't about us. That we are simply focusing on trying to glorify God. And that's how we get to this place of humility. Now, you may find yourself as you're singing this, thinking about, oh, look how humble I'm being. As if somehow... You know, wormwood is coming into us and teaching. But remember how C.S. Lewis argued this? Just laugh. Just laugh at him and just go on and just focus on Jesus. So if you're willing, I'm going to encourage you to stand. We're going to sing this together. And then right when we're done, we're going to go into open worship. So you'll be able to just sit down where you are. We'll have a couple of minutes of openness. If God puts something on our heart, you can share. And I'll close this. So we're going to sing. Open worship for a few minutes, and then I'll close this. Let's sing together. Take time to be holy. Speak off with the Lord. Abide in Him. Whatever be 